Good morning. It's morning. nice to be back with you again this morning. Um, and we'll just uh, open with a very brief word of prayer. Yeah. Father, just conscious as we open your word that it's not just a book. These are not just words, but it's living truth. It's the God for whom nothing is impossible, the God who created heaven and earth. We choose to speak with us. So hear us. Help us to hear what you would say to us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's so nice to look out and see so many full seats. It's brilliant. It's really good what God's doing here amongst you. It's a real encouragement for us to come. I've spent much of the last six months um, in the book of Hebrews. It's a book that, if I'm honest, up until now, I've largely avoided because I've always thought it was a bit too hard um, to get my head around and there's some pretty difficult passages in there, aren't there? Ask some pretty difficult questions. But having bitten the bullet, I have absolutely loved it. Um, and got so much for myself and so I just want to share some thoughts today with you based on these studies. Um, and where do you jump off? Well, I'm jumping off in one of the more obscure passages, uh, chapter 12, verses 18 to 24. So let's read that together. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 24. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, to heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. There are some difficult passages in Hebrews, for sure. But one of, one of the big impressions I've taken out of reading through this book many times is how how our life of faith, our life, our, our, our growing in our knowledge of God, particularly in the person of Jesus Christ, is a journey. Yeah, sometimes a difficult and torturous journey. But <coughs> sometimes in that journey we can drift and become directionless and feel a little bit lost. Sometimes it's a journey of joy and of victory and wonder. But it is a journey. And we never actually really ever standing still. Sometimes there are storms and challenges on the way. But always it's a journey. And it's a journey towards a magnificent prize. So today I want to take us on a wee bit of a journey as well. Um, from Genesis to Revelation. So don't worry, I'm not going to spend the whole day. From Genesis to Revelation, taking it along the way two gardens, two mountains, and two cities. This morning, we're going to be in the Old Testament part predominantly of that journey. Um, and this evening, we're going to complete it in the New Testament. So I don't hope that none of you have got plans for this evening. <laughs> it, it is very much a two-part um, today that we'll be, we're just taking a break in the middle rather than finishing. <coughs> And the big theme, really, of, of Hebrews is that God, thrice holy, almighty God, God the Most High, is revealing himself. He's making himself known and he's making himself knowable, especially through Jesus Christ. But always on the journey that he's bringing us home. He's bringing us home to our eternal rest, which is our living with him in his presence forever. I guess it's a pretty well summarized, actually, in the first verse of the book. Long ago, 
at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God has in love made himself known. His greatest desire for us is that we would know and love him in return to share close knowledge of and a close communion with him forever. Because that is the essence of true life. Of true living. Let's start at the very beginning and go right back to our first garden, which unsurprisingly, I guess, for you all is Eden. It's a magnificent setting for a desperately sad encounter. And reading in chapter 3 and verse 8 to 13, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden, but the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. God said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman put you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. And the Lord God said, what is it that you have done? The beauty of God's garden, created in love by him and created for us. Peopled with his crowning creation, mankind, made in his image, his likeness. And created for him and he with him. There he comes in the cool of the day to walk beside them. Commune with his precious creation his people Adam and Eve. There's something beautifully close and comfortable and unthreateningly intimate in walking with someone and communing beside them. It's the thing my wife Andrea, I do struggle sometimes to remember <laughs> it's, one, it's one of the things that Andrea and I enjoy um, more than anything I think really is walking and talking listening, being heard, and oftentimes just enjoying the special closeness of not needing to speak as we walk. Just enjoying God's creation and one another's intimate company. And that is what I believe is the essence of God's rest. I mean, it's what we were made for. To be with Him, and just to commune with Him, to know His closeness. To listen, to be listened to heard and be understood but we were made for that with our creator the Lord himself but there's a problem Adam and Eve like we all do they believed the lie and they chose to turn their back on God they chose to go their own way and so they're journeying away from him rather than seeking his face and the result is tragic. From intimacy and communion to distance and fear. Driven from God's presence, wrapped with regret, hiding from him in fear, separated from God, communion broken. That's what the Bible calls death, spiritual death. But the wonder of the story of our Bibles is that this tells us how that God comes down in grace and love to restore that communion, that intimacy, that rest. And it's quite a journey. The first person after Adam and Eve that I want us just to look at briefly is referenced in Hebrews 11 and 5, and he's the man by the name of Enoch. By faith Enoch was taken up so he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. So here we've got just a little vignette, if you like, a little picture of a contrast between Adam and Eve. Here's Enoch. He believed God, he sought his face, until God just brought him into his presence to be with him 
walk with him in close intimacy. That is what we all crave. That is all, what we are made for. That is what God desires for each one of us. The next and one of the main he, um, characters that we read of in, in Hebrews is Abraham. He also believed God and obeyed his call to follow him. In chapter 11, verses 8 to 10, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with them of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Just a couple of little things to pick up in this passage. First, that Abraham believed and, and he obeyed. But he didn't know where he was going. He had no details about the where or the when or the how. He just believed God and went and followed. And the remarkable story where he offers up Isaac in no understanding. But he trusts God. That God is in control. And that God does know what the how and the why are. Abraham believed and trusted the person of God who had made himself known to him. And Abraham was on this journey, this wonderful journey of growing to know him. And the eventual destination of Abraham's journey, this passage tells us, it wasn't Canaan. It wasn't the promised land. It was the heavenly city, that place where God dwells. And that's the first of our cities. So we've had a we've had a, a garden and we've had a city, which we'll come back to. God's making himself known and establishing a relationship with Abraham also introduces a very important concept both in the book of Hebrews and then right throughout our Bibles, and that of a covenant. A covenant is a promise. An irrefutable promise here by a God who cannot lie. Hebrews 6, 4, 18. And a God who is faithful to his promise. Hebrews 10, 23. He who promised is faithful. I think often when we, when we talk about the covenant and covenant promise, we compare it to our marriage vows. Um, where we promise to one another that we'll be faithful in love no matter what. God himself uses that image for his covenant. But you know, I think in, in a lot of ways, a better image and comparison is not with a marriage covenant, but with a contract of adoption, where the adopter chooses and promises to protect and provide in love forever, no matter what. And regardless of whether or not that love is ever reciprocated, and that's God's covenant with us, an unconditional promise. No matter what, this is what I'll do. So that's the background. And now to our journey as God gradually reveals himself to mankind. And it's particularly this that I'm thinking of as we, as we go through this morning and this evening. That God is gradually revealing more and more of himself through scripture. And starting with the two mountains that we read of at the start of Hebrews 12, Sinai, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. Mount Sinai is not named, but it's clearly referenced, and it's what's being spoken of here. Where in Exodus 20, God, having delivered his people from the slavery of Egypt, by the remarkable miracle as he brings them through the Red Sea, he gathers them at the foot of Mount Sinai to give them the law. And we read in Exodus 20, Verses 18 to 21. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. And they stood afar off and said to Moses, You speak to us and we'll listen. Do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, Don't fear. For God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin people stood far off and Moses 
while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Here, <coughs> like in the Garden of Eden, people, his people, God's people, people like you and I have been distanced from God by sin and rebellion, turning our backs on God. The relationship with God here is marked with fear and trembling. A separation is stood afar off and distance. God was afar off. He was shrouded in darkness, cloud and mystery, unapproachable in glory and holiness. Even God's friend Moses recalled repeatedly through Hebrews. The one who asked God, can I see you? Can I see your glory? He was prevented from seeing God. He was hidden from him. It feels on one part like we've travelled a long way from the Garden of Eden. But on another sense, it seems like we're even further away, doesn't it? Far off in fear and trembling, while God is in darkness and cloud. And that's the contrast that the writer to the Hebrews wants us to very clearly see. They're on the way to the promised land, the land of Canaan. It's described in scripture like a garden, a land flowing with milk and honey, but sadly again, sin, rebellion, rejection of God causes the sentence of exclusion. And for 40 years, they wander in the desert. However, even then, even there, God reaches out and he reaches down so that he could be he establishes the tabernacle where his people can come near to him. Wow. They come near, but it's through a system of rituals and sacrifices. Hebrews is full of references to this, ta this tabernacle, the, the rituals and the systems of sacrifice. The writer tells us how God progressively is establishing a way that man can be near to him again. That, that relationship that's broken by sin and rejection can be restored. The first, the two things I want to draw from that is firstly, whilst God glory, glory, whilst God's glory was now constantly visible and nearby in the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. We're even told in uh, chapter 40 of Exodus, verse 34, that it came in dwelled and filled the tabernacle. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. He was there amidst, dwelling amongst his people. But he was still distant. He was still unseeable. He was still largely unknowable. And the second thing with the tabernacle is nobody could approach or speak with him except after ritual washing by the priest and on the altar offering blood sacrifices close but still a long way off we're going to jump a little bit aside but if there's somebody who's referenced in Hebrews again and look at briefly at another person who's referenced in chapter 11 32 Elijah I mention him only because God reveals himself to him in a way that I personally find tremendously poignant and moving. Here the Lord reveals an often hidden aspect of his glory and heart in a way that contrasts so markedly with these other examples of fear and trembling and distance and farness. The change and the, the contrast between fear and fire, thunder and distance here, a little story in the background is that after the triumph of the priests of Baal on Mount Carmel, Elijah descends literally from the mountain down into the valley and figuratively from the mountaintop of a tremendous experience and demonstration of God's power into fear and depression and despair. The tender of God comes. read in 1st Kings 19 11 and 12 and he said go out and stand on the mount before the Lord 
And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke into pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not annoyed. And after the earthquake, after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. Again, which takes our minds back to Sinai. fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He does dwell in inapproachable light. He is totally holy and our sin distances us from that holiness but in our, in our times of need he does come close. He shows his face when we seek it with all our heart. It's massively encouraging for us to know and should encourage us to move from fear to boldly approaching the throne of grace from distance and separation to closeness and intimately knowing the exciting bit of how and why we can do that that's God's heart but how can that be come back this evening and you'll find out the next stopping point on our journey is now in what is both our second mountain Mount Zion but it's also our first city, which is uh, Jerusalem. Throughout scripture, Mount Zion refers both to God's earthly city, Jerusalem, and points us and hints at his heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. The importance, though, we over mustn't overlook it is this, that, that we mustn't get caught up with the physical location. What makes Zion, Zion? What makes the city of God the city of God is when he is dwelling there. Here I am, Isaiah 8, 18, here I am and the children the Lord has given me. We are signs and symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. Or Psalm 74, do you remember the nation you purchased long ago, the people of your inheritance who you redeemed, Mount Zion, where you dwell? So appropriately, it's here in Jerusalem, Mount Zion, that we found the magnificence of what we call um, Solomon's Temple. It's really not Solomon's Temple, it's God's Temple, because every single detail is painstakingly described of what this temple was to be by God. And again, there's a couple of things I want to highlight from this temple and our first visit to, to, to Zion, Mount Zion, Jerusalem. This temple had unrivaled and unrepeated splendor. It was adorned with images from a garden, interestingly. Fruit and flowers, trees and blossoms were everywhere within the temple. And God's glory filled the temple and he dwelt there in the midst of his people, in his city, amongst his people, but it was still strangely distant. It was still unsatisfactory to any heart that was earnestly seeking to know him. To, to have that close relationship, to walk and be beside him, it was still not their experience. And whilst God's presence was palpably close, he dwelt in, in the sanctuary and there holy of holies, separated from his people by that thick, impenetrable curtain. Access was once a year only, then by one person alone, the high priest, and then only with an, a sacrifice of blood. And even then, the high priest, he entered in fear of his life. For those of us who were born as Gentiles, the entire temple was a forbidden place. Knowledge of God, distant impossibility. The next step on our journey is the time of Jesus, and the magnificent temple of Solomon has been destroyed, been burnt to the ground as the people were carried off to Babylon in slavery, far from God's temple, far from God's city, far from God's presence. However, a much less splendid version of the temple had been rebuilt at the time of Zerubbabel. 
And again, at the Holy of Holies, separated by that thick curtain, with access severely restricted. The one thing it did have, giving hope to the Gentiles, was an outer area known as the Court of the Gentiles, far away from the Holy Place, but one little step closer, with this hope that maybe, somehow, someday, we might know our Creator God. Andrew's even worried when I say this next sentence. Please don't take this the wrong way, but every time I say that, she's, she's terrified of what I'm going to say. Please don't take this the wrong way, but in one regard, I hope that you found everything I've shared with you this morning about journeying to an intimate relationship and knowledge of God very unsatisfactory. Lacking reality, missing something. I actually hope it seems distant and shadowy. Because it's, that is exactly what it's meant to be. We're meant to be left feeling like we're crying out for something more. There must be something better than this distance, this once a year, this one person, this only with a blood sacrifice. And we're meant to feel that way. And the writer of the Hebrews, speaking of priests and sacrifices and the tabernacle and offerings, in chapter 8 and 5, he says, they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. They are just a shadow. In chapter 9, in verses 7 to 9, but only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins that the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshipper. And then again in chapter 10 and verse 1, for since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. In our journey of life, finding our true meaning and purpose of knowing God, of being known by Him, of having that relationship restored, all the Old Testament institutions, experiences of image, can agree with the reality of life as God desires and designed us to, to know and to have. The need in each one of us to know the reality of who God is, what it is to be loved and forgiven and accepted by Him into His real and loving relationship of intimate communion. His walking in, with Him, knowing that closeness, is found in Christ alone. Who can break down the barriers? Who can reopen access? How is it that someone who is marked by sin can know and commune with a perfect, thrice holy God? In a slightly different context, the same truth is put in Colossians 2.17. These are shadows of things that are to come. But the reality is found We started at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke. He has. He did. He does make himself known. But as we've looked at all these different pictures in the mountains, in the cities, in the Old Testament, it's distant. It's shadowy. It's unsatisfactory. It's not what our soul longs for. The verse continues, however, in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. As we come to the end for this morning, I hope it feels like it's getting closer. Maybe tantalizingly close even. But maybe we all understand that we're not there yet. And all that God established in the Old Testament 
wasn't what his desire was, for us to know and be known, for us to have the reality that we pray. And Jesus can and he does bring <coughs> that reality, that relationship, that closeness, something that's no longer unsatisfactory, no longer shadowy and distant, but something that's tangible something that's real, something that's close, something that's near. And I'm going to leave that hanging there for this evening. If you come back, that's what we're going to talk about. Through the New Testament, to a new mountain, a new city, a new garden, and the reality through Jesus Christ.